I welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is a day that the Lord has made, and I trust that you are rejoicing and glad in it. We'd like to welcome you to worship for Grace and Bethel United Methodist Churches, and we are so glad that you were able to join us this morning. So, let us pray. Lord, we come this day to worship and to thank you for the many ways that you guide our lives. We ask that our hearts, that our ears, and that our spirits may be open to your healing words of love. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, if you will join with me as we share in our prayer of confession. Merciful Lord, we like to think that we do everything well. We pat ourselves on the back when we act with love and mercy toward others, complimenting ourselves and self-righteousness. But you know us better. You know our faults and our failings. You know when we are falsely proclaiming that we are truly living as you would have us live. Teach us, Father. Teach us about your forgiving and healing love. Show us ways of merciful living that we may extend the love and mercy that you have given, to, given us to share with others. Forgive us, we pray. And for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now hear these words of assurance. Rejoice. You are loved by God who judges our, your failures and heals your hearts and spirits. In Jesus' name, we are all forgiven. We are all healed. Amen. We have two scriptures readings for this morning. The first comes from Romans chapter 12, verses 10 through 16. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in your confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse those, or don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. And don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Take it comes from the Gospel of Matthew. We'll be reading in chapter 18, verses 15 to 17. If another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, then you've won that person back. But if you are unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. If the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. A lot of us grew up with the peanuts cartoons and there was one where Lucy is demanding that Linus go and change the TV channels and then threatens him with her fist if he doesn't. What makes you think you can walk right in here and take over? asked Linus. These five fingers, says Lucy. Individually they're nothing. But when I curl them together like this into a single unit, they form a weapon that is terrible to behold. To which Linus replies, what channel do you want, sis? And turning away, Linus looks down at his fingers and he says, why can't you guys organize like that? You know, it's, we, we snicker, but we think about 
the, the church and how that applies to us. Because it's important for us to, to work together. Because God has assigned us with a task to, to spread the good news. And, and unless we work as a team, it ain't going to happen. And then God will have to go look elsewhere to, to find someone else to reach out to our community. And it's a shame that some of the obstacles that uh, growing churches have and, and reaching out for, to others is discord and bickering that goes on within the church. In today's scripture, Paul gives the church in Rome or tells them how, how they should live together. And if they read this letter and follow his instructions, the church will be a place of unity and love. And then people will come knocking on the doors to get inside. For us, we need to remember that the Bible is not only a record of the past, but it's instruction for us now. If we become a place that exemplifies the qualities that were mentioned in this passage, people will come knocking down our doors. And wouldn't you love to be around people who, who will stick by one another through thick and thin? People who think more of others than they do themselves. People who are easy to get along with. Because isn't harmony so much more pleasant than chaos and conflict? You know, this is God's plan for the church. And it's what you and I, all of us here, should be striving for. It should be our goal. Unfortunately, sometimes within the church, there are some that aren't striving for that goal. Because there's unhappiness in their lives. And, and for some reason, they just got to share that unhappiness with everybody. And then the reality is conflict happens. It's an unavoidable fact of life. And, and we need to learn how to deal with it. But we need to learn how to deal with it God's way. And that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. How to deal with this conflict when it happens. Some folks, and, and I must admit, I have been guilty of this myself, use, use unconstructive ways to deal with conflicts or disagreement. They, they tend to deal with conflict by, by avoiding the person that they most need to talk to. They think, well, if I ignore it long enough, it's just going to go away. So you give them a silent treatment. Or maybe you go running to someone else and, and then you start telling them about their, the disagreement because then you want to get folk on your side. Because then, you know, we're, they're thinking that if we got the majority of the people on my side, I must be right. And that other person, they're going to have to admit they're wrong. And then they need to go ahead and apologize. But that's a way that we, we avoid taking the responsibility by, for ourselves and then trying to justify ourselves on what's going on. Because then we feel good because everybody's on our side. But the problem is, the only person that you've convinced is yourself. God ain't so easily convinced. In fact, there's some strong words in the Bible that talk about it. And the Bible calls it gossip and slander. So, how, how, do, we, how do we confront this? How do we look at this disagreement? And, and, and how do we deal with it God's way? So, Let's say, Steve and Paul have just had this big argument. Steve comes in and he says, look here, preacher. Paul did such and such and such and such. And man, it made me angry. You know what I'm going to say? Do you know what I then would say to Paul? Or excuse me, what I would say to Steve? I would look at him and say, Steve, have you gone and talked to Paul about it? And when he looks and says, well, no, I ain't done that. Then I'm going to say, well, that's what you need to do first. 
Because that's what Jesus wants us to do. Because this is the best way for us to start. Because there's no chance for gossip. There's, there's, there's a greater chance that there's going to be resolution. And because it may be something just simple. Just a simple misunderstanding that the two can talk about and clear it up. And then be done with. But Steve and Paul, they can't seem to come to an agreement. So what does Jesus tell us to do next? Jesus says to, to find somebody. Choose a person that's, that's impartial. Someone that's wise. Someone that's a, a peacemaker. Now, you may be saying, okay, Bridget, what's that going to accomplish? Well, if, if you're going to someone directly and you've spoken to them about the problem, uh, they may have been caught off guard. They may have gotten defensive. But if you have that peacemaker, that mediator that goes with you, then maybe that can get them, the mediator can get them to chill a little bit. And, and then they don't feel quite as threatened. The mediator may also be able to correct you because, think about it, you might have misread the other person. You might have taken it the wrong way. Um, you may have only heard half of the conversation and, and you may have to go directly to the person and, and, and you know, what did what you say was wrong? Or, or it upset me and, and they just probably, well, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't say that. But then the mediator who's sitting there listening, who's impartial, can point out that that comment wasn't directed at you. Or, hey, Steve, you took it the wrong way, bro. Re remember, Sometimes when we go into something looking for an apology, we end up being the one who gives the apology. The final step that, that Jesus gives us is a little bit more drastic. This is where you, you take it to the church. 99.9% .9 of all conflicts, though, can be sorted out and worked through if we use the first two steps properly rarely needs to happen that we bring it to the church elders. But if you've, if you've approached the person and, and they haven't listened to you and then you've taken that mediator and peacemaker and they still won't listen, then bring it to the church and let the elders of the church know that. Because when we go to this point, the goal is we want to restore the person. We don't want to beat up on them. We don't want to kick them out of the church. We want to keep them here. But we also want to resolve that conflict. You know, there are some positive consequences that come from resolving conflict. You have closer relationships. You have greater maturity for both people that are involved. And you have that, uh, that experience of helping others make it through so the next time you can do better or that the next time it's you, you know how to handle it. And it's nothing better than to reconcile a broken relationship. In Matthew 5, 23 to 24, it says, So if you're presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar. Go and you be reconciled to that person. Then come back and offer your sacrifice to God. You know, this, this passage tells us to, to sort out our relationship with others before coming to God. You know, it, there's a story about Leonardo da Vinci who was painting the Last Supper. And he had this bitter argument with a fellow painter. And Leonardo was so enraged that he decided to paint the face of his enemy as the face of Judas. That way, the hated painter's face would be preserved for ages in the face of the betraying disciple. But when Leonardo finished Judas, everyone easily and quickly recognized the face of the painter with whom was the person that Leonardo had been fighting with. Leonardo continued working on the painting, and as much as he tried, though, he could not paint the face of Jesus. Something was just holding him back. It just wasn't working. 
Leonardo decided his hatred toward that fellow painter was his problem. So he worked through his hatred, hatred by repainting Judas's face. He replaced that image of his fellow painter with a, an entirely different face. Then guess what he was able to do? Then he was able to paint Jesus' face and complete the masterpiece. When, when we're out of, of sync, when we're out of fellowship with others, it's hard for us to have fellowship with God. Remember the part in the Lord's Prayer that goes, Forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. You know, as we prepare to deal with, with this thing that we were having a problem with or the conflict that we're dealing with, we need to remember to spend time in prayer to pray for each other, to pray for the right time, to pray for the, the ability to be able to talk, and to pray that God will prepare us, both of us, and give us the wisdom to be able to, to talk this through. We need to remember to check ourselves, to check our heart for, for sin and a wrong motive, and, and that we're approaching them with in the right way, that we're genuinely wanting to solve this conflict. And if we can, or if we're not, it's easy to pray more. If we start dealing with our conflict, you know, to navigate these waters, a couple of things we want to remember. One, start soon. Don't wait until the problem just festers and gets worse. Deal with it. Do it face to face, not over the phone, not over an email, not through a text, not by a written letter, because there are emotions and, and, and facial gestures that, that can help us communicate our love and our care and our acceptance of what the other person is saying. Because the last thing we want to do is try to navigate these, this sensitive issue with miscommunication. By letting the other person know that we're not doing this because we want to bust their chops, but we want them to resolve it because we care about them. We want what's best for them. We want to reaffirm our relationship. We want to put them at ease and, and, and we want to take them off the defensive. You know, sometimes we want to go and start by saying, man, there's something I just got to talk to you about. You know, it, it's not easy for me to say, but I value our relationship. I value our friendship. And then lead into your discussion. You know, make, make observations, not accusations. Say, you know, man, I was offended by what you said rather than you offended me. T take ownership for how you feel. Accusations put people on the defensive observations put them a little bit more at ease and then remember get the facts as Joe Friday used to say just the facts man just the facts listen get their side ask questions did I hear that right and then be willing to to change your point of view or change your stance if you found out you were wrong also be prepared and be ready to apologize if you reacted wrong. And then finally, promote resolution. Don't just leave things up in the air. Like, you know, where, where, where do we go from here? You know, is there something, a new understanding of one another that, that can, can fix things? You know, maybe if you if you think, you know, we go back to Steve and Paul and their disagreement. If, if, if you know that, that Steve's a little sensitive about a particular subject, then you need to be a little, you need to be a little different in how you approach it or how you bring it up. Choose your words more carefully. A good way to, to end a conflict is by affirming the relationship and then pray for one another. Now, 
Folks, I wish I could say that all conflicts will end easily. Some won't. Some things are, can never be resolved. We've all heard of people who haven't seen a parent or, or a brother or sister or friend for years. They've given up calling because they're tired of being abused when they call or, or they get hung up on. To this, the Bible offers us some comfort. In Romans 12, 18, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. If at all, if it is possible, it tells us that it may not be. As far as it depends on you means that you only have to do your part. And live in peace. Well, that's our goal. Our goal is to live in peace with one another. You know, Jesus prays for the church. Jesus wanted a church that was characterized by unity. He wanted it so much that on the night before He was crucified and while He was praying in the garden, He, he said this in His prayer. I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who have ever believed in Me through their message. I pray that they will be will all be one just as you and I are one. Father, and may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. Folks, unity in the church and in the lives of believers is, is important. Jesus said that it will be how the world comes to believe in Him. When we show love for one another in our relationships and we show love and in, in, in being able to reaffirm those relationships and, and how we deal with conflict, unchurched people will see the difference in us. And in them seeing that, that's where the difference will be made. When they see that we can resolve conflict, that we can come together and be the church, that's when they come knocking on our doors. That's when they come rolling in. But we have to make that step. That's in Jesus' name. Amen. As you go out on this Labor Day weekend, one, be safe. Also remember to be healthy. But go with these words from our Father. The peace of our Lord Jesus has been poured out on you. Now go into the world bringing hope, forgiveness, and peace to others. And remember that God's peace is with you always.